Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today I wanted to dedicate an episode on how to reverse financial adversity. One of the most difficult aspects of third density in our current economy is when you suddenly have some terrible financial adversity and how to deal with that. With what we understand so far about reality creation and the law of attraction, this is very difficult. If you lose your job, you're naturally going to be scared and worried and anxious and all kinds of negative emotions are going to come up and that's going to create similar circumstances and it becomes a wave of misfortune. So we have to figure out how to deal with financial adversity because all of us will deal with it on some level at some point in time. You lose a job, your stocks go broke, your house has some damage, car breaks down, you end up having to go bankrupt. All kinds of things will happen. So how do we reverse financial adversity? How do we not only deal with it, but how can we reverse it? It is sometimes said of a person that one is into the market. Usually this indicates the person has an investment portfolio of stocks and bonds. In a very real sense, we are all into the market. For unless we are living as a hermit in a cave, we require goods and services in order to live and source of income to make it possible, which is very much affected by fluctuations of the economy. It is being increasingly acknowledged that economics is basically a psychological phenomenon. If everybody says there's inflation and then inflation starts going up because people are worried about the prices, it's all psychological. Government agencies may release statistics and charts indicating fluctuations of the workforce, business activity, interest rates, and the gross national product. Very impressive. Conveniently, nothing is said about the cause. This is because it is a mystical process dealing with the trends of thoughts of we the people. The economy, as far as we are concerned, will always be about us, about what we make it, how we decree it, and what we expect it to be. In the conversations at the bridge table, during coffee breaks, and just about everywhere, people pass the time of the day. The major items of discussion are job security, the deficit, interest rates, the presidency, the erosion of the value of the dollar, and the price of food at the supermarket. If the consensus is that something awful is happening, then something is happening right there. For the economy is little more than a barometer that registers the highs and lows of consciousness. Wherever two or three are gathered together in an interaction of minds, a very real energy force is projected into the world. Sometimes we call it a pendulum. Sometimes it's just simply group thought. And if it happens to be a prayer group or a positive discussion group, then there is healing or prosperity influence. If it is the sharing of negativity, as is so often the case, the majority of the time, that consciousness goes forth as a beacon of darkness, adding to the weakening of the economy. Many analysts have searched for causes for fluctuations of the stock market. Perhaps they need to look no further than right here in our hearts. There was an article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal some years ago that said, positive thinking is the way out of our economic malaise. It went on to decry the excessive pessimism that is now engulfing us. It quoted the president of a large corporation as urging business leaders to adopt a more positive attitude to help dispel fears of impending economic doom and to restore confidence in the American people. It is easy to let such advice go right over our heads, just agreeing, yes, that is something they should do. However, you are the leader of your business affairs, and as a student of truth and of the mind, you should become a leader in all conversational groupings. Thus, whenever the discussion turns to the high cost of things and the lagging business of your employer and the frightening cycles of inflation and recession, don't acquiesce in negative conclusions. Don't say, oh, it's all because of so-and-so, and that's how it is. It's conspiracy. It's all doom and apocalypse. What are you contributing when you do that? Position yourself squarely on the side of the prosperity potential and let something good be said. 
People may be talking about supply-side economics. Perhaps what is needed is truth-side economics. You can find something positive to say and to think about what's going on no matter what. And people will thrive in terrible economies. And you contribute to the economy by your very thought and the words that you say. And by the news that you digest and then regurgitate to others. Psalm 1, 1 through 3 has a great prosperity lesson for contemporary times. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The psalmist clearly states that if you refuse to agree with the gossip of negative people, the counsel of the wicked, and keep yourself in tune with the divine law of prosperity, then you can be certain that substance will flow as easily to you as substance flows to the tree planted by the river of water. This is a very important realization. You don't have to ride the wave of what is happening in the news to determine whether or not you are prosperous. You are the source. The great discovery of new insight in truth is that consciousness is the key to all things, not some things, all things which happen to us. Certainly the key to personal prosperity, the starting point in changing your life from financial reverses to an experience of abundance is the realization that you can change your life by altering your thoughts. I have stated this over and over again in a million different ways, but it doesn't change what's going on. And I have had a lot of people come to me that say, Brian, with the economy the way it is, or with these new regulations or the quarantine or blah, 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 it's just made it so I can't do what I want to do. It's so tough. The economy is struggling. I won't be able to make what I want to make. You must begin by taking responsibility for your own life. Nobody else is responsible. You begin by taking responsibility. As long as you're hung up on paranoid thoughts such as it is what they are it is happening in washington office politics the irs is going to take me down they hired so many it's guaranteed i must give up now admit to yourself that your present experience even the conditions of your bank account reflects your present level of awareness you are not the victim of circumstances Consciousness creates circumstances, or at least sets the climate in which they happen. When you establish yourself in this awareness, then you are in a position to change things. Because if the cause is in you, in your level of consciousness, then the cure can be affected by changing your thoughts, by altering the cause. If, however, the cause is out there, in people, or circumstances, then there is little you can do. It's just one of those things. Again, the need is not to find the way to get something, but to alter the inner state of mind that have been blocking the natural flow of substance and light into your life. It may be reflected in a salary increase, or it could result in some investment dividends. Essentially, it will come through consciousness. Now, we live in a world of many cross-currents of consciousness, if we are honest, we will admit that we are not always able to sustain positive attitudes in all circumstances. Negativity sometimes floods the mind and there seems little we can do about it. Thus, for one reason or another, things sometimes go wrong. Perhaps it is a job that hasn't worked out. Maybe it is a sudden need for financing in a tight money market. Or an unexpected loss in a heavily depended on investment. In every attempt in life. There must be the possibility of success and failure. We must have the stability and the perspective to deal with both success and failure in spiritual poise. You see, to become too elated with success and too crushed by defeat is indicative of an imbalance in consciousness. In every setback, we are buoyed up with the realization that nothing is ever a complete loss there's always some gain, some growth, and in every success, we should be humbled with the realization that without the action of forces greater than ourselves, we could not have succeeded. 
What are you placing importance on? Are you placing importance on economic events or political events? Is that how you're determining your own prosperity? There may be a portion of you that is against the politics of what's going on, so you want the economy to crumble, and so you're rooting against your own prosperity? Have you had the thought, oh, it would be so terrible if our economy did well, because then so-and-so would be more successful? Life is fundamentally a matter of growing, a growth experience. Missing the mark, as Neville Goddard likes to say, is the one sin, is one of the ways in which we learn to hit the target. Failure is a vital part of achieving success. We have erroneously thought of success as getting there, while actually success is earning the right to be there. And earning means learning. Setbacks, even failures, may be an important part of that learning. This may include a stock that didn't perform as expected, a cryptocurrency that went down in price, a brief fling in a business that failed, or even an occasional experience of unemployment. There are all ways in which we earn the right to achieve the prosperity and success that we all dream about. Any education that prepares people only for success and not for coping with the frustration of things going wrong is sadly deficient. It simply succeeds in inhibiting a large number of people from attempting ventures where failure is a possibility, which severely cripples this creativity and imagination. I meet so many people that are so afraid of failure, they simply never begin that business or that project that would give them the prosperity that they would easily acquire. One of the most challenging reverses that we ever have to deal with is unemployment. I've had to deal with it, and I am pretty sure many of the people that are listening to this have had to deal with it. The important thing is, it is not being unemployed or even being employed that makes the difference in our lives, but how we accept these conditions how we react to them, the attitudes, the feelings, the general tone of our consciousness as we face the experience. I like to say everything is working to my advantage. You can try my meditation. Everything is working to my advantage. And I try to program this reaction to unfortunate circumstances in my life. It's one way to get me out of the reactive mode that happens so easily when unfortunate financial adversity occurs in my life. There are some employed people who live in constant fear of being laid off. And there are people out of work who have complete confidence that it is a transition which will lead inevitably to betterment. The people who have jobs and are constantly afraid they will be dismissed are already blocking their flow. They are setting a time bomb that will go off at some future point. Perhaps not in the actual loss of their jobs, but in some frustration in the job or in some kind of financial stringency. The sad thing is that many persons who are unemployed have actually become unemployable because they have allowed the idea of lack and inactivity to become established in their consciousness. Unemployment and the self-pity and bitterness associated with it becomes an obsession that blocks the activity of reemployment or the reinfusion of the substance flow. The first need is not to find a job, but to change the self-image, to resign from enlistment in the army of the unemployed. Don't see yourself as unemployed, but as ready for work. As long as you're unemployed, you will tend to identify with the labor department statistics showing things to be so bad that it might even be foolish to look for work. However, if you're ready for work, you are in an entirely different ballgame. I've met people that won't go look for a job because, oh, the statistics show that there is a lot of joblessness right now and jobs don't look good. They look to the statistics that they hear on TV to determine whether or not they're going to get a job. If you should be out of work, then you really have a job. The most important and challenging job you have ever had, the job is to get work. Set about this job as you would any other job. Get up early pack your lunch, get neatly dressed, set off enthusiastically and expectantly in your work of finding a job. Look forward to it. Be happy. A new opportunity is on the way. The important thing is work at it. See it as a challenge to your faith and determine to grow through the experience. Don't listen to the advice of negative Nancys and creep hangers, what Psalm 1 calls the counsel of the wicked. They will be singing their perpetual dirge. No jobs to be had. Recession is inevitable. At your age, you'll never get a job, and so on. You are a whole person in a whole universe, 
You are an individualized expression of God, an individualized expression of the creative flow. There is something you can do that no one can do quite as uniquely as you. Somewhere there is a need for that special contribution. You are needed. Even as you have a need, if you lose sight of this awareness, you abdicate from the universe. As you sit thinking, if I could only find a job, some employer is at that very moment thinking, if I could only locate the right person for this opening. Keep that vision of the orderly universe. It is not a miracle that is needed to create a job for you, but an expression of divine order in bringing you together in that which is looking for you. There is a divine universal mind counterpart for every human need. There's an answer for every problem, substance for every financial requirement, a job for every willing worker. The economic indicators will not tell you this. The welfare agencies will not tell you this. You will need to tell it to yourself. For economics is a spiritual process. As far as your experience in the marketplace is concerned, you make the difference. You are the source. There is an innocuous phrase used often in the Bible. It came to pass. It has a subtle inference that it can be extremely meaningful to you. The problem or financial reversal did not come into your life to stay. It came to pass. Whatever the challenge, refuse to be panic-stricken. I know that you're panicking. There's someone out here that hears my voice that is panicking right now. Don't panic. Life has not ended for you. It flows on in a healing and prospering stream. In the face of any challenge, affirm, I accept the reality of the situation, but not its permanence. The experience is there to be met. There is no use hiding your head in the sand. However, determine to meet it on your terms. Don't let the outer happening squeeze you into its box, but open your mind to the flow of wisdom and love and good judgment with which you can deal masterfully with it. It has come to pass. Accept it, but accept it as a changing experience that is on its way out. Something better is on the way for you. For instance, in meeting the experience of unemployment, normally there is fear, self-pity, and a sense of insecurity. It is important to understand that this comes from a subtle acceptance of the permanence of the condition. If you hold to the thought that it has come to pass, seeing it as a moving experience, suddenly your confidence is restored, along with your feeling of oneness with the divine flow. In the study of truth, we talk often about the power of words. It is important to put into verbal form only those statements that you really want to see manifest in your life. Certainly, we are all too permissive in the things that we say about financial conditions in the world. Sometimes the difficulty is in the repeated use of words that could be replaced with some which have a more positive suggestion. For instance, the word problem. You may say, I have this problem. Immediately, the mind turns to dark meanings and impassable obstacles and impossible people. A much better word to employ when referring to some kind of challenge is project. Note what happens when you say, I have this project. It makes all the difference in the world. The word project suggests a positive endeavor of development. There's a tendency to deal with a problem with tension and strain, and the only miracle can save me now, consciousness. We tackle a project such as putting a man on the moon with vigor and imagination and in the conviction that it will be done. What projects do you have before you in your life? If you make a list of problems, you might well wring your hands and feel terrible about your burden, but a list of projects, it even has an exciting ring. Can't you just see yourself rubbing your hands in enthusiasm, eager to commence, and expectant of a positive outworking? Take a careful look at the challenges you are facing, a possible layoff, an important career decision, the inability to make ends meet on your current income. If you identify these as your problems, there is a tendency to see them as static and burdensome and with a feeling of resentment and self-pity. And in the quest for solutions, you will invariably be looking for help or advice from people or for some miracle of God. In other words, you are looking for someone, even God, to shoulder the responsibility, but it simply won't work. However, see the challenges as projects and you tune in on a whole different flow of consciousness. You are faced with some opportunities to grow, but you feel secure in the awareness that, in the main, the answers will unfold from within. 
There's a sense of lightness, a clear horizon, and of confident expectancy. It is the same soul called trouble, but your attitude is different. And according to your thoughts, your faith, and your feeling, it will be done unto you. It is a mystic teaching that is ages old, that comes from multiple books that I've read on this channel. Old books like Think and Grow Rich are still amazingly relevant. Whenever you are faced with a naughty financial dilemma, you always have a clear choice of how you will deal with it, how you will react. If you brood over the letdown, the disappointment in a job, or some complete collapse of a financial involvement, you simply magnify it out of all proportion. It is like taking a pebble off the beach and holding it close to your eyes. It may be a small stone, but held close enough, it can completely screen your view. Hold it at proper viewing distance and it can be examined and properly dealt with. Drop it at your feet and it can become a part of a stone path. The psalmist says, thou hast put all things under his feet. Psalms 8.6 The loss of a job or the failure of some important financial project held too closely in consciousness may appear to be the end of everything. As one man said when he was passed over for promotion to a higher position, my life is over, I just can't go on. And because he allowed this experience to obscure all else, he brooded for months and became so lethargic in his work that he very nearly lost the position he did have. Fortunately, in time, he came to his senses, realizing that by reason of his immature reaction, he proved his unworthiness for the greater responsibility. Life did go on, and later he was picked for a higher post, much more suited to his creative ability, so it proved to be a growth experience. It has been said that there is a little paranoia in everyone. Thus, when some untoward thing occurs, it is not at all unusual for us to react in a way that implies that the universe is picking on us. Why did this happen to me? How could they do this? One man said of his company that laid him off after 20 years of employment, they mined my life and completely made a bum out of me. Can't you just see him walking down the railroad tracks, carrying his possessions in a red bandana, tied to the end of his stick over his shoulder? Poor man. They ruined his life. Of course, it is a total delusion. No one, no one can ruin your life. You are always responsible for the way you accept things that happen to you. You are the source. The incident is external. The reaction is always your own. A financial crisis may have occurred and it may appear that you are at the bottom financially, but it is still out there. You are still an inlet and may become an outlet to all there is in God. You may have been fired from your job, but no one can ever fire you from the universe. You are still God's living enterprise and God cannot fail. All that really counts is what is happening within you. How are you reacting to the experience? Where is your faith? Within you is a limitless, unborn potential of creativity and substance. And the present experience can be your great opportunity to give birth to it. Thus, if you will, the tragedy can become a blessing. The disadvantage can become an advantage. The failure can become an opportunity. And the disappointment can become God's appointment. When you are grounded in the field of limitless substance, then you may be broke, but you can never be poor. It is a marvelous awareness to hold on. You live in the wisdom and substance of infinite mind. You may be out of work, but you cannot be out of flow of creativity. You may have a difficulty, but you are forever one with the guiding light of spirit by which you can go through the experience and even grow through it. Shakespeare had this in mind when he said, in As You Like It, Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in its head, and this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. You can learn a helpful lesson from the lowly oyster. He's normally a very placid fellow, but occasionally little grains of sand work their way inside his shell and begin irritating him. Naturally, he tries to get rid of them, but when he discovers he can't do this, he settles down and produces one of the most priceless and beautiful things in the world. He turns the irritation into a pearl, so no matter what the difficulty, 
the loss, the financial adversity. If you are feeling negative, get busy purling. By the all things work together for good principle, by the everything works to your advantage principle, any experience of life can become the best thing that ever happened to you. Haven't you said or heard someone say, I was certainly upset about that challenge, but now as I see it in retrospect, it was the best thing that could have happened to me. Every major financial adversity that I have faced has been the best thing that has ever happened to me. It is occasionally said of alcoholism or drug addiction or bankruptcy or unemployment, but why wait? Why not accept the possibility right when the crisis occurs? Why not pick out the most difficult thing facing you right now and say this with me? Affirm this with me. Say this when you reach that point. I know that this is the best thing that could happen to me. For I know that in the happening there is revealed a new lesson to learn and some new growth to experience. I know that within me is an unborn possibility of limitless potentialities. And this is my opportunity to begin to give birth to new ideas, new strength, and new vision. I accept the reality of the difficulty, but not its permanence. I am not at the end of anything. I am simply between opportunities, between jobs. I know that in the movement of it has come to pass, uh, something wonderful is on its way, far surpassing anything I have ever known before me. And if I should feel the slightest irritation of fear or anxiety, I will say to myself, all right, let's get busy purling. Everything is working to my advantage. Something wonderful is happening for me now. I know that may sound glib. For some of you that are listening to this, going through something very difficult right now, some sort of financial adversity, I know that it may sound so ridiculous. In certain states of mind, it does. But I promise you, if you give it time and you look back on it, you'll know that I was right. Accept the reality of this situation, but not its permanence. Everything is going to work out. Everything's going to work out for you. And in many cases, the adversity that you face is a signal for something that can help you to make money. When I have lost jobs, I found other businesses or the loss of the job gave me insight into a new business that I needed. And I would never have been able to start that business without the loss of that job or that terrible opportunity or the loss of my investment. Be excited for adversity because it may mean a huge transformation in your life and it may lead you to true prosperity because true prosperity is the freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want. And if you're concerned or worried about some financial adversity, then you haven't reached that point yet. So let it go. Move on and find the advantage in the situation that you're in. And let's get busy purling. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Powerful fourth density technologies. Images designed to magnetize and broadcast. Available at newearth.art. Welcome to the Reality Revolution.